thank you everyone for being here and having the patience to listen to what is really quite a lot of dense material this morning that I'm going to be giving you. So I, I hope that you'll bear with me because I'm going to get into some pretty heavy theoretical stuff, um, more so even the statistics. This is going to we're going down the rabbit hole this morning, so I'll take you with me. Uh, <laughs> you'll see why. Uh, my project is called Transformative Reinscriptions, Traumatic Memories and Testimonia in Chile. Um, and during this project, I worked with Professor Nitschak at the Universidad de Chile. Um, I spent a lot of time, like a lot of time, in the archives at the Museo de la Memoria y los Derechos Humanos. Um, I also spent quite a bit of time interviewing and having conversations with a journalist and author named Vivian Levine, and she, up until very recently, was affiliated with the Radio Universidad de Chile. And later on, because I have some other projects that I'm working on that will be coming down the pipeline pretty, too, pretty soon too, um, I've also begun a working relationship with the Pontificia Universidad Católica for some other projects coming up. So, here we go. Um, my project overview, um, essentially, I'm doing an interdisciplinary study on a literary genre called Testimonio regarding women political prisoners under the Pinochet dictatorship, which was 1970s and 1980s. Um, I originally was going to look at one particular case study, which is a testimonial, a testimonial novel, I guess for now is what I'll call it, called El Infierno by Luz Arce Sandoval. Um, in my initial presentation at the beginning of this experience, I gave you guys a little bit of background, but roughly to recap, um, she had been in former President Allende's inner circle and worked with La Moneda shortly before the, the coup d'etat in 1973. And what ended up happening is that she was taken prisoner after going into hiding for quite some time. Um, brutally tortured, which she talks about in her novel, and then eventually ended up collaborating with the Dina, which was the kind of secret police during this time period. Um, so she really did see both extremes of the political situation during that time. Later, she ended up giving her testimony at the Reddick Commission, which was the Truth Commission that happened after the restoration of democracy in the 90s. Um, so her, it was really quite scandalous. I, I did see some of the press that they have in the archives at the Museo, where you know this is showing up in roughly what would be like the equivalent of like the National Enquirer, or whatever. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's this like huge breaking thing, because she was really the first one from inside of the Dina to come out with what had happened and give testimony publicly about what was going on and explaining the structural hierarchy of the institutions that really up to that point were a mystery and were not being disclosed. Uh, there have been two major truth commissions which have happened in lieu of the, the dictatorship. The first, as I mentioned, was the Reddick Commission, which specifically addressed the detained disappeared and there are a little less than 2,000 individuals that were recognized in that report. Now, could there certainly be inclusions of much more? Absolutely, but because of the restrictive nature of the scope of this investigation, that is what was included. Um, the Valak report relates to the findings of the Valak Commission, which was the uh, Truth Commission dealing with torture and political imprisonment. And in that report, there are almost, well, it's about 28,000 individuals that had been recognized in this report. Now, what's interesting about the Valak report, and I will get into this a little bit later, because I read it, and it's, it's pretty dense material, um, the content of the testimonies are still sealed. They are to be confidential for 50 years. And this is obviously a contentious debate the individuals who gave testimony have been recognized. Their names are public, it's there with the root, but what they said is still confidential. Um, there 
is a lot of backlash saying that this information should be made public precisely because it undermines the purpose of the Truth Commission itself if this information is not available to the public. So um, I'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, and I ended up, be, because of wonderful recommendations made at the beginning of this experience, working with uh, Vivian Levine, who is a author as well as a journalist, and she wrote this wonderful book called Mujeres Tras las Orejas de Pinochet, where she carried out interviews with three women who were militants and the left and had been imprisoned, tortured, and again gave their testimony at the Valak Commission. And she talks about their experiences under political imprisonment, and this is also another example of this literary genre. So. Uh, those conversations that I had with her were really, really insightful and gave me some other ways of looking and framing the questions that I had proposed in this project to begin with. Um, my key research questions at the beginning are what is testimonio, what are its characteristics as a literary genre, uh, where is the line between this literary genre and testimony, like legal testimony in a truth commission, for example, if there is one. Um, how can testimonial be used as a tool for personal healing? And how can testimonial be applied to larger frameworks for peace building? And the images you have there, these are Arce's original testimony documents prior to the Reading Commission, which they have in the archives at the Museo de la Memoria. And I was able to go digging through all of her stuff. And so I was really excited to find these documents. I had to do a lot of digging to find them, but I did find them. And what you see there, it's, it's not very clear in the picture, and I apologize for that. But she had written out and drawn out the hierarchy of the chain of command, which up to that point had really been a mystery and a way of evading responsibility. Um, so. Her, her testimony was extremely important because it broke down this wall of silence uh, that had existed up to that point. Um, I used interdisciplinary methodologies in this project. Originally, it was only just three, but I ended up adding a fourth through this project. Um, so the first one is a narratological approach, which looks at testimony as a literary genre. Um, and I asked the question, how can the genre be categorized and what are its characteristics? And where is the line between fiction and nonfiction? How can we look at the narrator author inside of this text when the, the line between the two is very blurry? Um, I also got into a juridical approach which looks at testimony in a legal sense. Um, testimony and truth commissions, and then where does this literary genre fit into a political framework for transitional and transformative justice. Um, I also get into a psychoanalytical approach which looks at testimonio as a transformation of trauma, um, looking at uh, this concept called scriptotherapy, which is therapy through writing, and testimonio as a collaborative act um, textually as well as discursively. Um, and then lastly, I added this in, or I parsed this out a little bit better between juridical and ethical. Um, I added an ethical approach and separated that out from like the law, so to speak, looking at testimony as a textual space for encounter, reconciliation, and the formation of a sense of ethics. Um, testimony being a collaborative and collective action towards peace building. And also possibly as a pedagogical tool to promote the formation of what um, Martha Nussbaum, who's a scholar I'll mention later, calls a sympathetic imagination. Um, so as a literary genre, probably the most important theorist that I was looking at was John Beverly, and he wrote this book in 2004 called Testimonio on the Politics of Truth. And he, in this book, talks specifically about another example of the genre, which was Jo Rigoberta Mentu, um, who was a Guatemalan woman who talked about the genocides that were carried out during the Guatemalan Civil War as his case study. And he gives a really great description of the characteristics of this genre, um, which I assert Arce and Levine's texts are also examples of this same literary genre. Um, 
it can be anything from you know a short novella all the way up to a novel in length. Um, the most important thing is that it's articulated in the first person and it recounts a lived experience, but that even though the author is generally writing in the first person singular, there's an implicit plural voice in the genre of literature that speaks for a community. And usually it's a community that is oppressed in some way or has been marginalized or who has been treated poorly. It could be through violence, it could be through poverty, it could be a lot of different things. Um, and differently from like a recorded participant narrative where you would have uh, an author just interviewing and taking data, so to speak, from the interviews, the author, interviewer possibly, is inside of the text and is the narrator as well. So there, as I said before, there's this really strange, blurry relationship between the author and the narrator and sometimes even the protagonist of the story um, inside of this genre. Um, and as he said, the situation of narration and testimonio has to involve an urgency to communicate a problem of repression, poverty, subalternity, imprisonment, struggle for survival uh, implicated in the act of narration itself. So this genre is essentially seeking out an audience to bring attention to a serious social problem. Um, and in this way, the focus is more on sincerity rather than the literariness or the aesthetics of it. Um, so to begin to unpack this really dense theoretical framework I was talking about, um, we're going to get into Lacan. And I don't know if you're familiar with Lacan, but he is a French theorist who was very popular during 1950s, 1960s-ish. Um, and he comes from the field of uh, psychoanalysis. He follows Freud and kind of builds on his own strategies. But I am also going to connect him with another uh, French formalist theorist, which was Ferdinand de Saussure. So Lacan basically says, you know, following Freud, he creates these three orders in this essay, which he calls the mirror stage. And that's what that. Uh, first image at the top kind of shows as a diagram of how this works. The idea is that in the formation of the ego, an infant looks into a mirror at some point, and it does happen. I, I saw my daughter do it earlier this year for the first time. And that reflection is a jarring experience because up until that point, the infant does not conceptualize themselves as separate from their mother. And it's this image in the mirror that really begins to form their own subjectivity in subject-object kind of relationships. So the first order, so to speak, that he calls is the imaginary. And this is the internalized image of the ideal whole self that we see in the mirror. And this is generally not an accurate representation. We, we look at ourselves and see something like perfect. Um, and the situ this is situated around a notion of coherence rather than fragmentation, and this is roughly aligned, like I said, of the formation of the ego and Freud. Um, and this mediates the internal world, the psyche, with the external world. Um, in Saussure, which is the second diagram at the bottom, uh, this concept is the signified. Uh, which is a concept of a symbolized arbitrarily, or a concept symbolized arbitrarily by a sign. So this is an image that we see in our brain. Um, if I say tree, which is a sign, you see a picture. And that tree could look very different. It could be a Christmas tree, it could be a nice oak tree, but you will see an image in your brain. This is the imaginary. The symbolic order is the formation of signifiers and language. So this is the introduction into language. And this is also the introduction in this way into culture. And this order determines the subject and our subjectivity. Um, so as I said, it's associated with language, words, writing. We exist in the symbolic order because we use language and symbols and signs to organize our world and make sense of it. Um, and we can't leave this world. Once you're in it, you're in. <laughs> so in Saussure, this is the signifier. So you see the Latin word arbor, 
which means tree. It could be written or it could be the sounds that I say. If I say tree or if you see tree written, that triggers this image in your brain. So the imaginary and the symbolic are connected in that way. Um, the real, which is the world that I've been working in for a while, um, it's a paradox, so to speak, because it is precisely what is not representable in language or the imaginary. Um, in Lacan, this is pre-mirror stage, pre-language, what precisely cannot be symbolized and the real disappears as soon as it comes back into language. So in Saussure, we see this image, it's the bar between the imaginary and the symbolic. Um, so why am I bringing this up? Because one of the things that I think has been most important in the formation of my theory is the relationship between language and trauma um, and how this relates to literature and the production of this genre. So to continue, this gives a little bit better of a diagram. This is kind of his little formula, signifier, signified, and then the sign. Um, the symbolic relates to the signifier, the imaginary relates to the signified, and then the real is the bar. Um, so uh, Zizek, who is another really important philosopher right now and has worked extensively on Lacan, and he loves to talk about the real, uh, says that the real is not simply external reality, it is rather, as Lacan put it, impossible, something which can neither be directly experienced nor symbolized, like a traumatic encounter of extreme violence which destabilizes our entire universe of meaning. As such, the real can only be discerned in its traces, effects, and aftershocks. And those traces are precisely what start to manifest themselves in this genre of literature. Um, the full experience of the real is impossible to articulate from within the symbolic. So I realize right now I'm working within a paradox, talking about the real, and for this very reason, I think Lacan spoke very little about the real. He, he did not say a lot about it. Um, so trauma and language. Um, with these ideas in mind, the next theorist that I connected my work with was Elaine Scarry, and she wrote this book called The Body in Pain, The Making and Unmaking of the World, 1987. And she talks precisely about this relationship between pain or trauma and language. Um, she suggests essentially that trauma rips the victim from the symbolic and in that moment of trauma puts them into the real, precisely because that experience is not expressible. You cannot articulate it. You can come close to it. We use lots of different techniques to mediate it, like metaphors, um, but you can't exactly touch that experience. And in the reestablishment of language through therapy, which is a Freudian idea originally, he called it the talking cure, was to bring the victim of trauma back into language and back into the symbolic order um, as a way to heal. So I have a couple of really important quotes that kind of encapsulate Scary's ideas in a nutshell. Um, she says, whatever pain achieves, it achieves in part through its unshareability, and it ensures this unshareability through its resistance to language. English, writes Virginia Woolf, who's a really great author, which can express the thoughts of Hamlet and the tragedy of Lear has no words for the shiver or the headache. The merest schoolgirl, when she falls in love, has Shakespeare or Keats to speak her mind for her. But let a sufferer try to describe a pain in his head to a doctor, and language at once runs dry. Physical pain does not simply resist language, but actively destroys it, bringing about an immediate reversion to a state anterior to language, to the sounds and cries a human being makes before language is learned. Uh, she goes on to say, to witness the moment when pain causes a reversion to the pre-language of cries and groans is to witness the destruction of language. But conversely, to be present when a person moves up out of that pre-language and projects the facts of sentience into speech is almost to have been permitted to pr be present at the birth of language itself, um, which I think is absolutely fascinating. But like I said, we use metaphor. So if you go to the doctor and say, I have a headache, it's a stabbing pain, it's a dull pain, it's an aching pain, it's a burning pain, but we don't really have accurate 
language to describe this phenomenon. We resort to a lot of other ways to circumvent it. So continuing on this idea, um, Judith, Lew and Her Judith Lewis Herman is, um, she's a clinical psychologist and she wrote this really influential book called Trauma and Recovery in 1992. And she says that the relationship between trauma and language also disrupts our relationships in a broader social respect. Um, she says, I'll quote from 51 in her book, traumatic events call into question basic human relationships. They breach the attachments of family, friendship, love, and community. They shatter the construction of the self that is formed and sustained in relation to others. They undermine the belief system that give meaning to human experience. They violate the victim's faith in a natural or divine order and cast the victim into a state of existential crisis. The damage to relational life is not second, a secondary effect of trauma as originally thought. Traumatic events have primary effects not only on the psychological structures of the self, but also on the systems of attachment and meaning that link individual and community. And this is extremely important because as Lacan notes in this mirror stage, essentially what ends up happening as we move out of the stage of infancy is we use the rest of the world as our mirror. We project ourselves out and we receive feedback from the people around us to validate our sense of self and our sense of identity. And trauma fractures that kind of a relationship and fractures our sense of reality and possibly even our sense of self, as Herman kind of insinuates. Uh, she goes on to say, when we begin the process of giving testimony about trauma, she says, in the second stage of recovery, the survivor tells the story of trauma. She tells it completely in depth and in detail. This work of reconstruction actually transforms the traumatic memory so that it can be integrated into the survivor's life story. Traumatic memory, by contrast, is wordless and static. It does not develop or progress in time, and it does not reveal the storyteller's feelings or interpretation of events. Out of the fragmented components of frozen imagery and sensation, patient and therapist slowly reassemble an organized, detailed verbal account oriented in time and historical context. So bringing this victim back into language through the use of narrative is this talking cure that Freud proposes as the way to mitigate uh, trauma. And Herman notes that traumatic memories have a number of unusual qualities. They're not encoded like ordinary memories of adults in a verbal linear narrative that is assimilated into an ongoing life story. We have a narrative going on inside of our heads every single day. And there have been multiple studies, um, neurological studies, which I wish I would have had time to cite them all here. Bessel van der Kolk is a theorist that talks about this at length. Traumatic, or traumatic memories are encoded differently in the brain. They manifest in different parts of the brain. And ironically, they show up in the areas that are associated with our baser instincts and survival mechanisms rather than in our cognitive and reasoning parts of the brain. What was the name of that researcher? Sorry. Bessel van der Kolk. Bessel van der Kolk. I'll give you the citation later if you'd like. Thank you for asking. <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. So in addition to talking about the actual victim, we also have to ask who is the therapist and who is the one who is receiving this testimony. And this is where my work with Vivian Levine was a really, really influential in how my project developed um, because I think something that's lacking in this field is there's very little research being done about how this relationship through testimony affects the person who receives it, not just the person who gives it. Um, Vivian told me that when she was writing her book, and this was a really long experience conducting all of these interviews, she got physically ill during this time. Like she started having stomach problems, she lost a lot of weight. So this transference of trauma, this shared traumatic experience that happens through testimony also affects the person who receives it. And it becomes a kind of like a symbiotic or reciprocal relationship. 
Um, Dory Laub, who is another theorist and he has worked a great deal on Holocaust studies, um, wrote in this really influential chapter of a larger book. Um, the chapter is called Bearing Witness or the Vicissitudes of Listening, which is from 92. It talks about testimony as a collaborative process, which requires the collaboration of a willing participant as well as what he calls an addressable other. And this person has to be an empathic listener and be willing to open up to this experience of receiving this testimony. And in this way, testimony is discursive. It is shared through language. Um, he says, by extension, the listener to trauma comes to be a participant and a co-owner of the traumatic event. Through his very listening, he comes to partially experience trauma in himself. These were the traces of the real that I was talking about earlier in Lacan. Uh, continuing, the relation of the victim to the event of the trauma therefore impacts on the relation of the listener to it, and the latter comes to feel the bewilderment, injury, confusion, dread, and conflicts that the trauma victim feels. He has to address all of these if he's to carry out his function as a listener, and if trauma is to emerge so that it hen so that it's henceforth impossible witnessing can indeed take place, the listener has to feel the victim's victories, defeats, and silences, know them from within, so that they can assume the form of testimony. Um, he goes on to say, for the testimonial process to take place, there needs to be a bonding, the intimate and total presence of an other in the position of one who hears. Testimonies are not monologues, they cannot take place in solitude. The witnesses are talking to somebody to somebody that they have been waiting for for a long time. Um, so moving on out of this and with this idea, my intervention in this point, oops, sorry, uh, my intervention is questioning whether this same process that would normally take place between a victim and a therapist, for example, can be mediated by a written text. My assertion is yes that it can, and that within this genre of testimonio, this could be a textual space, because text is also discursive, where this process could take place. Through mediation, of course, it's not going to be a face-to-face, -face, but it could be mediated in the same process with a text in the middle. Um, Hélène Cissou, who's a French theorist, and she kind of was working around the same time as Lacan, a little bit after him. Um, she wrote this influential essay called The Laugh of the Medusa in 1976. And she particularly, she's a feminist theorist, talks about the importance of writing and establishing a sense of agency. Um, she says in her essay, why don't you write? Write. Writing is for you. You are for you. Your body is yours. Take it. I know why you haven't written, because writing is at once too high, too great for you. It's reserved for the great, that is for great men, and it's silly, because you've written a little but in secret, and it wasn't good because it was in secret, and because you punished yourself for writing because you didn't go all the way. Write. Let no one hold you back. Let nothing stop you, not man, not the imbecilic capitalist machinery, and not yourself. Um, an important link that Sisu makes with the writing process is that she links it with the body. Um, and this was something that I found to be central, especially when talking about individuals who had been tortured physically or psychologically. Um, because discourse is mediated in this way, this traumatic experience, which was corporeal as well as psychic, has to also be linked with the body as well as with the text. And this is precisely what Sisu is asserting in her essay. Um, although I don't think she necessarily had the same intention in which I'm using it, but I think that it could be a fruitful, at least theoretical concept. Um, she goes on to say, she must write herself, and she separates those out, not herself, herself because this is the invention of a new insurgent writing which, when the moment of her liberation has come, will allow her to carry out the indispensable ruptures and transformations of her history. By writing herself, 
woman will return to her body, which has been more than confiscated from her, which has been turned into the uncanny stranger on display, the ailing or dead figure. Censor your body and you censor breath and speech at the same time. Write yourself, your body must be heard. Only then will the immense resources of the unconscious spring forth. This act will also be marked by women seizing the occasion to speak, hence her shattering entry into history, which has always been based on her suppression. To write and thus forge for herself an antilogos weapon, to become at will the taker and the initiator for her own right in every symbolic system, in every political process. So, Essentially, in a nutshell, what Sisu is saying is that using writing as a tool for those who have been oppressed or those who have been marginalized is a tool to recover one's own agency and to reinsert oneself into a more, I don't know if I want to use powerful situation, but at least to recover, um, as I said, a sense of agency through this process. And this can be an extremely useful concept for those who have been traumatized, for example, by torture. Um, the next theorist that I also engage is another French theorist, Emmanuel Levinas, and he has an essay, Totality and Infinity, Totality and Infinity, an, exteri an essay on exteriority. This comes from 61. Um, Levinas is, an interesting individual because he he bases his sense of ethics in difference to those who had preceded him on the sense of relationship and he has this concept of the face-to-face -face encounter as necessary for growing a sense of ethics or establishing a sense of ethics what this means or at least what he asserts is that when we have this face-to-face -face encounter and we're in relationship with other individuals um, we have an ethical obligation to protect them, just as they say in the same way have an ethical obligation to protect me and to stand up for my well-being. Um, and it's, again, it's a really interesting concept of how it is that simple. This relationship does establish that ethics. Um, he says in this essay, to approach the other in conversation is to welcome his expression, in which at each instant he overflows the idea a thought would carry away from it. It is therefore to receive from the other beyond the capacity of the I, which means exactly to have the idea of infinity. And I've seen some very beautiful artwork done with this face to face and then this like infinite relationship between the two. Um, the relation with the other, or conversation, again, he brings in discourse, is a non-allergic relation, an ethical relation, but inasmuch as it is welcome, this conversation is a teaching, so he also makes this a pedagogical relationship. Teaching is not reducible to maiutics. It comes from the exterior and brings me more than I contain. In its non-violent transitivity, the very epiphany of the face is produced. So, um, Essentially, what he establishes here is that the sense of ethics is predicated on relationship, an equal or almost unequal relationship because I hold the other in a higher esteem even than I do to myself. And I recognize that without the other, because we talked about Lacan and this reflection of ourself and validation of ourself and our subjectivity like the mirror, without this other in front of me, I cannot exist. And so I have to protect them for my own well-being. Again, it gets really dense in this part, so what I want to do is jump on to where does this fit into a more pragmatic sense. This is a lot of really dense theory up until this point. Um, what I'm interested in, now that we've established that uh, we have to have a sense of ethics and an ethical relationship with those around us, could possibly be mediated through a text or it could be through a face-to-face -face encounter, um, but that the recovery from trauma must be discursive and it must be done in a relationship. Where can this fit into a framework for peace building? What can we do with it? Um, 
because today I can tell you that after talking with tons of people throughout the last nine months, the trauma from uh, the dictatorship is still very much present. There are still a lot of people who are experiencing a great deal of pain because of what, what happened decades ago. Um, and that tells us that a truth commission, at least in the way that the Reddick Commission and the Violet Commission were carried out, was not entirely effective in addressing all of the needs of Chilean society. It may have perhaps met some of them, but it did not meet all of them. So one framework that I found extremely helpful was by Wendy Lamborn, and she is an Australian uh, peace studies scholar, I guess I'll put it that way. Um, what she does is she takes transitional justice, which is the framework that we've been using in all of these truth commissions. I mean, um, we just saw this week the prosecution of one of the former generals during the Bosnian-Serbian war from the, the ITCY. Um, this is still continuing, and it's a, a similar Western framework that we have been using, but yet we still see a lot of these problems, or problems popping up with this trauma. What Lamborn suggests is that instead of considering a transitional framework, we need to move towards a transformative framework. And instead of looking at, at this short-term <coughs> interim idea of what justice and peace building should mean, it needs to be long-term and sustainable. Um, so what she says here are that there are four elements and six principles in this framework for building a more transformative framework of peace building. Um, she says there's one that's accountability, which means a legal justice for crimes and atrocities that have been committed. Um, and this removes a sense of impunity, uh, which I think is something that people in Chile have felt because not everybody from the military government was prosecuted. Um, so there is a sense of impunity, especially after the amnesty law that was instituted um, with the new constitution. Um, the second is truth or having a sense of psychosocial justice, meaning we know what happened and we can freely express our lived experiences about this trauma. Um, she goes on to socioeconomic justice, which could include reparations, which could include um, trying to uh, deal with poverty or the consequences that have happened after mass violence, like rebuilding homes, finding people jobs, giving people health care access, like meeting the physical needs of people. And then political justice, which means we move towards democracy and we have a legal system that allows for political reform so that the same thing does not happen again. Um, the principles that she includes are symbolic justice and rituals. She says that um, these also need to be local experience. There isn't a one-size-fits-all formula that is going to work for every different society. So what happened or the methods that were used in Bosnia will probably not be applicable to what happened with the truth commissions in Rwanda, for example, because they are completely different cultures with completely different needs and expectations. Um, it also has temporal breadth. Instead of just living in the present, we need to deal with the past, and we also need to address and try to conceive a long-term future with sustainable relationships in this society. Um, there needs, as I said, local ownership and capacity building, structural transformation and institutional reform, which goes along with much of the legal processes that I had mentioned, um, relationship, transformation and reconciliation. This is something that I think has not really been done effectively up to this point with any of the truth commissions in the 20th century. There has not been a real transformation in the relationships in society. Um, and lastly, a holistic, integrated, and comprehensive approach that takes all of these things into consideration rather than dealing with them in a fragmented kind of way where NGOs do this over here, the government does this over here, private citizens do this over here, and they don't communicate um, because that is the situation that we're living with. There is a lot of fragmentation in these efforts to rebuild societies after mass violence. 
So my question was, where can literature fit in here? Um, where can testimonial literature, particularly this idea of testimonio, be of use within the structure? And what I came up with was clearly it fits very obviously into this element of truth because it articulates the traumatic experiences, it articulates the problems, it spreads a breadth of knowledge um, which could be any of these different kinds of truth because there's multiple kinds of truth. There's factual truth, there's personal truth, narrative truth, social truth, restorative truth. There is not just one truth. And that's one of the things that I think truth commissions have really gotten wrong up to this point is even though they collect a lot of interviews, they seem to articulate a very monolithic concept of the truth, the official truth, so to speak. And that excludes a lot of narratives like Arce's, for example, that don't fit into this mold. Um, and I think that is problematic. So this is a place where literature could fill in some of these gaps that I think are not being met. Um, clearly, writing is a symbolic ritual. Literature fulfills this need. Literature, in this way, having a written text leaves both a historic record, it reckons with the present, and then it also will affect future generations because these are books that we can leave. These are texts that the new generations can use to learn from the past. So it meets this need as well. Local ownership, being articulated by the people who lived the experience. They take ownership of this experience and articulate it in a way that they feel is most relevant for their cultural and social needs. Uh, structural transformation in institutional form. It is a vehicle, literature, as a way to articulate what the problems are and also create suggestions of how to change these problems and alleviate the suffering in these societies after mass violence. Relationship transformation and reconciliation. I just talked at length about how this text, this type of text, establishes a relationship between the writer and the one who reads it, which allows us this vehicle to share these lived experiences and possibly bring about a serious reconciliation, or at least initiate it, put the conversation on the table and at least make it an available conversation. And then lastly, a holistic, integrated, and comprehensive approach through textual mediation, we can tie all of these things together. We can share this information between lots of different institutions. And we can really, I think, bring about a, a different way of how we deal with mass violence. Um, OK. Lastly, um, John Paul Lederach, who is a, uh, he's a scholar of peace studies, actually, at Notre Dame. And you can't see that very well. but. Um, he has this concept of a place called reconciliation. Um, what I think is really important about this is that I think this place can exist inside of this text, of this type of text. He says that truth, mercy, justice, and peace, with all of their subcategories, are the components to bring about reconciliation in a serious way. If all of these things are present, um, we can bring about real change. Um, so my suggestion, at least, is that testimonio can be this place of reconciliation. Um, lastly, in concluding, um, all of this fits into what I would say is a really great opportunity for a pedagogical approach to how to deal with these. Um, Martha Nussbaum says that literature is a vehicle for building a compassionate imagination, for bringing people closer together, for allowing us to learn how to think about our experiences if we put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Um, and this could be through fiction, this could be through nonfiction. But literature can be a great tool to teach new generations about problems, you know, like what was lived in Chile, what, what the situation is right now, articulate these things and really transform our society in the future so that you know we don't have horrible atrocities have to happen anymore, or at least we can alleviate some of the suffering.
So here's my work cited. Um, lastly, I mean, my projects in the future are going to include, um, I'm going to be translating Vivian's book into English. So I'm hoping that we'll be publishing that in a year or two. Um, I'm also working with an interdisciplinary group between uh, La, Pontifici La Pontificia Universidad Católica and Notre Dame, and we are going to be having a conference in the spring here in Santiago on the topic of university Catholicism and identity politics. So some of my work that I've done with Vivian is going to come out in re relationship to um, the universities how they dealt with this time period and what their roles are in the identity politics of how we learn about memories and and these experiences. So um, thank you so much to Fulbright for this lovely experience that has been life changing. Um, thank you to all of the professors who I've worked with both at um, La Universidad de Chile, La Universidad Católica here, uh, La Católica del Norte because I was in Antofagasta for a while, Notre Dame, the Kellogg Institute, and thank you all for listening to my project and supporting my research. Thank you.